Ellen's book is filled with stories, so I'm going to begin with a bit of a story uh, and my connection on how Ellen uh, came here tonight. My uncle, Isidore Udell, was flying in a uh, Wellington bomber over Tunisia when he was shot down in January 1943. And if you go to the monument in Malta, you will see his name there. And before he, he went into the war, he was an amateur photographer. Uh, and a cousin of his, decades later, found boxes of film, undeveloped, some, some photographs there were. As her name was Cecilia Rabinovich, and she recognized something unique in his, uh, in his pictures. And she was, has a PhD in art history, so she had a special eye for, for that. And she created an exhibit called The Lost Expressionist, uh, Nick Udell's Journey, Journey in Images. And Ellen, uh, uh, I guess, was familiar of what, what, uh, what was done. And when she was in Malta, laid, uh, laid flowers at, at the monument for my, um, for my uncle, she, she, she wrote uh, Cecilia telling her what she did. Cecilia wrote me. And I reached out to Ellen to thank her very much for doing that. And that's the introduction uh, for her coming here tonight to speak. Ellen is well qualified to speak on this topic. First of all, she has. He looks just like you. He does. He, has, he does look like you. Well, he should. Uh, my father's a younger brother. Um, Ellen has a PhD in, in uh, communication at, and she's a professor at uh, Centennial College. And she's written an amazing book. It's for sale out there. And I encourage all of you to write, read it. I, I have read most of it. I've recognized two people's name. A cousin of mine is in the book. A friend of mine's uncle is in the book. I'm sure there's one more person I can find. It, and then what it is is tidbits of Jewish soldiers' life during World War II. And it, it, it's incredible. And I know it must have taken you years and years and years to, to do that with lots of interviews. So the book is for sale. I encourage you to read that. And prior to writing the book, you traveled across Canada, across Europe. You were a journalist, as I, I read your bio. She was a journalist for CTV News, CBC, CBC News, Globe and Mail, and uh, also the um, Canadian Press. So I'd like to welcome, real big welcome for Ellen Bessner coming here to speak on an amazing, amazing subject. Please tell me. Thank you very much. Trying to get a hug before you go. Okay, absolutely. A coronavirus hug, right? Okay, there you go. <laughs> no, no, don't come, don't go away, because we're, we're going to talk ready. about your, your, yes. your uncle for a second. Yes. Yes. Hi, everybody. Um, can you hear me all right? Yes. All right. I am a teacher, and I move around a lot, so um, they gave me a long leash. Uh, Hopefully, it'll be all right, because I, I want to move around so that you can see the slides. Um, I want to thank Arnold and Rafi and Alan and uh, my um, special guest tonight who is making his debut, public debut, not as a speaker, because I'm sure you've spoken many times, but what he's about to tell you tonight, later on in the presentation, has never been publicly shared with anyone except me and his wife, who's here, before. And I'm so honored to have Bob Delson here because um, a, little, a little later on in the spring, we're going to be uh, together with some other children of liberators and a liberator of Belson to at Liberation 75, which some of you may have heard of. It's a big conference that God, for, God willing, coronavirus won't cancel. Um, and he's going to be displaying these photos and mementos and stunning experiences that his father had liberating Belson. So I'm so honored that you're here to do this tonight. You. So you're the first people who ever heard this, so be nice, be gentle, okay? Uh, I also want to thank Arnold because um, I knew a bit about your uncle because I went to Winnipeg to study uh, the story of what happened. And before we get started, I'm just going to quickly say I didn't know a lot about this shul, except I came for bar mitzvah about 20 years ago, when my kids were about this big. And, uh, and I now know that, uh, because of my research, uh, the, 
the congregation, the history that is in this building, in this very room. I don't need to talk. You should all be doing the talking tonight, and I'm sure you will. So I'm so honored and humbled to be here in the presence of people who get this story and, and, and care about it the way I do. And I know Arnold said, you know, I'm not much of a speaker, but um, what we know about your uncle, um, tonight I taught you something you didn't know. That's right. So maybe you want to tell them what you learned. Well, here's the mics. Not, not completely. So Arnold was, sorry, Arnold yes. was um, uh, in a four-man crew. Well, his uncle, my uncle. Uh, sorry, Nikki was in a four-man crew. Here. And um, they were lost over Tunisia because they were based in Malta. Right? Right. Malta was the siege of Malta was probably one of the worst um, places for a airmen to be stationed because they had to defend the Germans and the Italians because the Italians and Germans were trying to make sure the Allies didn't land in North Africa uh, and they wanted to keep the shipping lanes going for the Wehrmacht and for the uh, Allies to not get anywhere close to where the Germans were because, the, you know, we were losing the war, right? So the people who were stationed in Malta were uh, under tremendous bombardment and there was hardly any food and the place itself, even if you weren't flying, you could get killed, which people did from Toronto, just by the bombardments. So what I found was that not only, unfortunately, and I'm so glad that we were able to go and play, pay our respects, we said Kaddish for him, I didn't know you yet, but I do that all over the world. And uh, when I just came for tonight, I researched that not only did your uncle get shot down by a night fighter, but we know who he was. But what did you learn tonight? That the, per the, plane, that, the plane that shot my uncle down, that plane was shot down as well. They got him back. They got him back. So I'm so happy that I was able to right. tell you this tonight. But, but I, I always, our understanding was that he was shot down from the ground. No. Not by We know plane. the pilot's name. Yep. Because he reported it. And now we know that he... They returned fire and he, he didn't come back either. So it was such a, a good thing to be able to share that with you tonight. Thank you. All right. So this is how tonight's going to go. Um, and if you guys give me the okay, then we'll get started. Right? Okay. Uh, so I'm going to give you uh, the talk that was advertised, share the story of the 17,000 Canadians of Jewish faith who served in the Canadian uniform and others in World War II, mainly focusing on um, the liberation as we're coming up towards the end of World War II. This coming summer is a very big anniversary, as you know, the 75th anniversary. Uh, then I'm going to call up Bob, and we're going to do a little... Q&A, when he's going to gently lead, or I'm going to gently lead him through his father's war experience, and then we're going to open it up for questions. And I'm giving you a quiz, because I'm a teacher. So there's newspapers out there, um, you can have those, you pay for them, the Canadian government uh, gives them out to high schoolers, um, and there is a quiz about that in the part of the speech. Is that okay? So if you don't have one, we'll get some and pass them around. Okay? Sound good? And then you open it up and you talk and we'll have Q&A with some of our special guests, including the Samuel brothers, who are going to talk about this amazing story, Wave, about their father and grandfather. Okay, and I also want to recognize Mrs. Evelyn Bayevsky, who's here tonight. Abba Bayevsky was a war artist, and she's here tonight. I didn't know she was coming, so it's a, where are you? You took your hat off. There you are. And it's an honor to have you with us tonight. Oh, thank you. Thank you. All right, so we are, maybe um, right, Ruffy, can you make this slide fit a little bit? I'm sorry, I may have messed it up. We're 75 years, I gotta situate you, 75 years ago tonight, this is what was happening with the Canadian Army. It was called Operation Veritable, and they were in Holland. Is that worse? There we are, perfect. Okay, if you can't hear me, you can't see, this is your night, so you just tell me and I'll fix it, we'll fix it. You're non-believers? Yeah. <laughs> so, the Canadian military was poised to cross the Rhine, actually they started February 8th, and by March 11th, they had gotten to the banks of the Rhine, close to it, for those of you who are history buffs, you know, and 
Among them were hundreds, maybe thousands, of Canadian Jewish boys. Why did they go? Well, like Captain Charles Krakauer, who was um, a doctor, who couldn't get a residency in Toronto because after you tried to get a residency after medical school, nobody would take Jews in Toronto for residency, so he had to move, so he moved to Saskatchewan, to Brooksby, Saskatchewan, to be a doctor there. And when the war broke out, he told his family, no one is doing the fighting for me, so I'm going to enlist in Regina. But I see it, that talk two ways. And by the way, if you know about the University of Toronto controversy now, where a lot of the academics have signed, that's his uncle is leading the fight, which makes very a sense, Howard Tannenbaum, makes a lot of sense. Because he said, I'm going to go to war because I don't want the Gentiles doing the fighting that I, as a Jew, should be doing. Also, I interpret it because no one in Canada was going to go to war to save a bunch of Jews. No one's fighting for me, so I have to go. It's two ways, and that's basically my book. You can go now. Okay, so that was Captain Krakow. Hi, Chudnovsky was originally from Montreal, moved to Toronto. He was a communist, went to Camp Nyveld. Anyone go to Camp Nyveld here? Or their kids? Okay. So they went by Chud by the time they were in um, the camp. And I asked him why he enlisted. Our hate, we have, I had double, triple reason to hate the Germans. Anti-Semitism, Hitler was had special treatment for the Jews, and even the anti-Semitism here, and the injustice here. I was going to clean up the whole work in one shot. Even that here. So I, uh, I'm communist, had special reasons, over and above what the general public had. And now, the reason that I called my book Double Thread is because of this fellow here, who most of us, Purim's coming, we can go like this to him too, right? But after the war, Mackenzie King did something nice for the Jews. One thing, which I discovered in my research. And he wrote a letter to the Canadian Jewish community, Canadian Jewish Congress, in 1947, and I have a copy of it, I'll show you, where he thanked Canada's Jewish community for their contribution to the war effort. And what he said in this letter, which shocked me, I remember sitting in the Montreal archives going, oh my God, this is the title of my book, what chutzpah. He said, for you, this war was a double threat. In this letter, he said, not only were you fighting for freedom and democracy and against Hitler, but you were fighting to save your very people from the final solution, the savior race. And I thought, that's, that's, that's my book. But then I also discovered that they were fighting because they had actually a triple threat. Because should they be shot down and captured with their dog tags, or their, take their underwear off, which happened, they had to do that in a POW camp, their fate would be very dark indeed. But they went, like Captain Krakauer, because they knew, and you, you will know these slides well, my non-Jewish audience, I have to teach them a little bit, but you will know that the Jewish community of Canada at the time, the wartime Jewish community, they knew what this was, because the letters stopped coming, right? or the letters that got through from back in Europe would say well, this is what was happening. And they knew a little bit about what Hitler wanted to do. They could not have known this. Have you ever seen this uh, the story that came out last year and you saw it in the National Post? Anybody else know about it? Okay, I better tell you then. So this is Hitler's book. Why do we know it's Hitler's book? Because in the flyleaf, anyone's a librarian, you know, there's a little, like, sticker, my dad used to have this, it said Ex Libris on it, and it had his actual signature, he kept it beside his bed. This book was bought by Library and Archives Canada last summer for $6,000, which was super controversial, why would we spend taxpayers' money on a Hitler book, but they wanted it because it shows something stunning. Here, if you read Yiddish or German, you'll know, it says Rasse Juden in den Staten, over 20,000 people, 1934, I think it says, or one. It has a list of all the cities in Canada, Montreal, Toronto, Vancouver, Windsor, Saskatoon, all the people who live there, and then Yudin, 
all the numbers. So they knew where the Jews were living because they were spies, of course, sympathizers. And it wasn't just a foreign war for these boys because they were afraid that the same thing that was happening to them in the pogroms in, 19, in 1880s and again in, um, now was going to come to our shores too. So it was a very personal war. It was a double threat for sure. So when Canada declared war, what day did Canada declare war? Anybody know? September 10th. Why? September 10th, yes. One week after the British. The Why did they wait, you know? Like to show they were independent. Completely. You got it. I'm giving you a prize. <laughs> Everyone gets one, but you can get one too. Um, it's a bookmark <laughs> from Veterans Affairs Canada for this year. So yeah, this is a Mackenzie King wanted to, you know, there was never any doubt that Canada was going to war. They'd already started calling people up in the summertime to guard the Welland Canal and to guard in installations that were strategic. But um, yeah, Canada needed a week to wait to debate. So they declared war, and it was also Arab Yom Kippur at the time, if anyone remembers, 1939, when the war broke out, it was September 13th. So the Jewish boys and the synagogues were told, you have to go, you need to go, go and list. It's our war, it's our fight, we have to, the rabbis were saying this. And even the Globe and Mail had a, a story about the sermons. Um, and now, then they went down and they tried to enlist and many of them were turned away. Not only because of the fact that Canada was only taking one division, one 60,000 people the first few months, they didn't think it was going to be a, a big war, but also for various problems regarding anti-Semitism. They didn't want Jews in the military. Because Canada was very, very British, very, very colonial, especially in the military, and they were anti-Semitic. So Harry Black, if you read the Canadian Jewish News a few weeks ago, my cover story on finding Blackie, so that's Harry Black at Harvard Collegiate. He told his friend that he wanted, he went in 39 before the war broke out to enlist. I mean, they knew he wanted to fly. And they said, no, we're not taking Jews. So he took a cattle boat to England and joined the RAF. It was not easy being Jewish in Canada in the 30s, as you will know. And I don't need to tell you the whole story of the anti-Semitism, the uh, golf clubs that wouldn't take Jews, the um, uh, renting, that you couldn't be a renter, you couldn't have property, you couldn't have cottages, and on and on. I mentioned the uh, University of Toronto, right? They wouldn't take their quotas, and Winnipeg had quotas as well for medical school. Um, and uh, there was, of course, this is the country of Christy Pitts, which I don't need to explain. Um, and of course this, which you all know, right? The MS St. Louis which Canada apologized for, but um, the deed was done. So, uh, I think it's kind of ironic now, being um, that the Jewish Community Center is now in Westdale, in Hamilton, when they wouldn't rent to Jews or people of color or anyone that was Chinese or anything, so it's kind of funny and ironic. Um, in Quebec City, my great uncle, Sidney Lazarevich, was the president of the synagogue. And the Quebec government, uh, city of Quebec, city government, didn't want them to expand. So in 1944, they finally gave in and they expanded the synagogue the night before the unveiling when they had the, uh, the tables were all set, there was gonna be a ribbon cutting. And my uncle Sidney went there at like midnight just to make sure everything, like the coffee was gonna be there and all that stuff. He found that people had firebombed the shul with Molotov cocktails because there was so much... This is 1944, and like five years the war has been on already. This is Canada. We haven't learned anything in 75 years. This is my family. My uncle is on the front page of the newspaper because that, that's, no one was killed, thank God. $10,000 damage, but the House of Commons said, oh, we're so sorry that you know, this is racism against Jews. We haven't changed in 75 years. Who is this? Very good. Monty Hall was actually um, at the University of Manitoba in Winnipeg, and he couldn't get into medical school because of quotas, so he went into sciences. And on his campus, they had what's called an uh, CRT, COTC, Canadian Officers Training Corps, which is like you could be in the reserves, go to university, train two days a week, and then when you finish, you can go into the army. So there was a big sign that said, wanted. Officers for the Armored Corps, that's tanks. And he said, I want to go. And I interviewed him for my book before he died. And the fellow at the desk said, um, we're not taking Jews. 
So what do you think he did for during the war? And if you read my book, you're not allowed to answer. What did he do? He didn't change his name after the war, he did. He went by the name of Monty Hall and became a famous Hollywood entertainer, but he went into the entertainment unit during the war and entertained the troops, which to his great, I mean, it helped him in his career, of course, but he always said that he was really upset that he wasn't able to go overseas the way these guys were. Who's that? Very famous, for young people who don't know, these are two of Canada's most famous comedians who were um, from Toronto, and they went overseas as, this is not, this is not a costume. They were actually trained. They knew which end of the gun was how to use. They were in a cave on 40 days after D-Day in Normandy doing shows while the bullets are still flying. And I didn't interview them because they'd passed already, but I interviewed their children. You know, this was serious for them. They didn't have to go, but they did. 40 days after D-Day, when the bullets were going. Who is this? Nope. No. Same guy, in uniform, doing basic training. I'm sure his wife would be very upset if I showed you that picture of his underarms in a kilt. This is Senator David Kroll, who was Canada's first Jewish senator, Ontario's first Jewish cabinet minister, and the two-time mayor of Windsor. Why did he enlist? He's old-ish. I mean, for the time, he was an old guy. He had three kids already. He enlisted because the colonel who was in charge of the Essex Scottish, did not allow Jews to enlist. He lost the election to Kroll, too, so he wasn't too fond of Kroll, but he also didn't like Jews. So the local boy said, Mayor, sir, we want to enlist, help us. So he called up the Windsor newspaper, and he said, send a photographer, yay, social media, down to the Windsor Armory, and uh, he enlisted as a buck private. I say buck because that's what you earned, $1.30 a day. Your dad earned that too when he enlisted. And his wife was like, are you crazy? We have three daughters. You're the mayor. How are we supposed to raise a family on $1.30 a day? But the mayor, or Private Kroll, said he wanted to show the country that Jews were fighting and he wanted to open the door for Jewish service. And this is why he did it. And Colonel Weigel made him clean the latrines because he was an anti-Semite. Eventually, he became an officer and then a colonel, and then a lieutenant colonel, and a famous dispatch rider, and he ended up commanding the Oxford Rifles, which was very important as a Jew. Pretty senior job during the war. Whoever said Dunkelman was right, Ben Dunkelman was also one of the most famous Canadian Jews who served, not just in this war, but in 48, with the Machals. He was very well off, as you know. He had a mansion where Sunnybrook Farm is, Sunnybrook Hospital, he had his own yacht named Ginny, he went to Upper Canada College. So when the war broke out, he tried to enlist in the Navy, because he knew how to sail, and they never called him. And he waited and waited, and he said, I have a score to settle with Hitler. And they never called him, because they didn't want Jews to be officers in the Navy. And a little later on, I'm going to show you that actually was a true thing. So what did the Canadian Jewish community do? They set up their own recruiting offices in Toronto on Beverly Street, 150 Beverly, which was where the Jewish um, Congress was. And this is Montreal, so who can read Yiddish? You could probably tell me better what it says. Canada Eden, help in the Milchama. How did I do? Pretty good? And I don't know what the last word is. What is this word? Bumenhood, what does that mean? I don't know. Anyway, basically they had some responsible First World War veterans to sort of show them the ropes, how to go through interviews, which regiments were taking Jews, which regiments weren't, because they had to help the boys enlist. And they had, this one was in Park Avenue in Montreal, if anyone's from Montreal, Park Avenue, um, in Yiddish, English, and French. And they did come from all parts of the country, and families sent almost everybody that was eligible unless they were medically unfit or they had to work on a farm or other reasons. Like the Mazer family from Ottawa, they had nine children. Anyone from Ottawa? So the rabbi, Mazer, had nine kids. Seven were in uniform. The other two were too little. Um, from Saskatchewan, Kamsak, five Ulfman brothers. One was killed, Shia, the middle one. 
And then the other younger ones were um, in the Machal, because they were too young for this war. This is some numbers. So remember I told you what Dunkelman said? Look at the Navy numbers. None, hardly any. This is the Air Force, and they wanted smart Jews because the Jews could do navigation if you had an education. They wanted people who were um, high school graduates, good in math, good in trigonometry, good in, so it could be navigators mostly. And lots in the army. And then there was 2,000 who didn't put their names down, uh, didn't put their religion down. So there's about 19,000 who served and merchant marines. Um, so if there was 168,000 Jews in Canada during that time, 1940, and we had 16,830, what's the percentage? Yeah, and that's exactly what it was for the non-Jewish population. So if everyone said Jews didn't fight, no, we totally did. Same exact numbers, same exact percentage, but we had a way harder time getting in, being in, and on the battlefield. And I'll show you what happens next. Why did they not put their uh, religion down? Because as your uh, uncle had his attestation papers here, it goes right here where you have to write it. They write it for you Hebrew. See it? Isidore Nicholas Udell. But it also goes on all your other stuff. Your dog tags. Your army pay book, which you have to carry into battle with you. A lot of them didn't. They threw it out but because they were you know, going over to D-Day and they didn't want to get caught. But they had to. And so this is why it was very courageous to put this down. They were heroic for doing it. Because when you did that, it opened all kinds of Chazerai questions, which today, if you were a labor person or human resources person, you would literally be fired for asking these kinds of questions and writing these comments. This is someone your family will know from Hamilton, the Balanson family, Alex Balanson. Anyone else from Hamilton? It's your cousin, right. So he was a strapping, good-looking, locally-born, high school graduate, athletic. He wanted to be an Air Force crewman. When he went down, the very first thing they put down on the papers is the religion, which I have never seen for other religions. Only Jews. Then how nice he is, amazing, fantastic, good physique, which he really did. He was an athlete. And then look at this stuff. Will be rather pushy, rather rough due to background. And this is what was on there. If you're a woman, it was worse. Okay, I mean, they didn't have Weinstein getting convicted last week or the Me Too moment in those days. So if you were a woman, Rose Goodman, who enlisted, there were 270 women enlisted, including my aunt. Look what they write. Attractive! <laughs> then Hebrew. Then they, remember, because I told you religion goes first? Then her age, how amazing she was, because she graduated from Dalhousie University, and she was a girl guide. Like, who went to university in, in those days? Nobody. Uh, and then they did a credit check on her father. How anti-Semitic can you get? I mean, he owned a department store, which was like the Eatons of the Maritimes. It was called Goodman, so they were well off. But really? So yeah. And they didn't earn a buck thirty a day. How much do you think the girls earned? No, a little more, 70 cents a day. And you couldn't wear nail polish, and you had to wear a skirt at all times. Horrible. So a lot of people changed their names. As you said, Moshe Kozowatsky changed his name to Dick Steele. <laughs> he was a communist and a very famous labor leader who was um, um, Steele for Stalin. And he was a very brave tank commander when he signed up. And it didn't stop after they got overseas, the anti-Semitism. So they got overseas. Sonny Isaacs, from Winnipeg originally, was studying in Toronto and working as a, a bookkeeper accountant. And he was a navigator in a bomber in England. And this is what I asked him, how was your life there? I'll tell you one that, that really bothered me a lot. This wasn't a training, this was while well, we were in operations. Oh, so the overseas are ready. Oh, yeah. Okay, so we'll get to yeah. that after. After, yeah. after I'd done probably a dozen raids, and uh, we were sitting in, in the officer's wet canteen. What squadron was this? 427? 427, mm -hmm. yeah. And there was a bunch of guys sitting around drinking. And all of a sudden, one of the, one of the who was an officer pipes up, you know what, Udu? He says, after the war, we've got to take Hitler back to Canada with us so we can clean up Jews out of Canada. Yeah. Was he really drunk? He must, well, I don't know. <laughs> oh my god. I mean, I, I, I just, 
he was twice as big as me, so I, <laughs> so I, I, I was just felt bad that I wasn't big enough to hit him over the head with a bottle or something. Not everybody hid their religion. As I said, uh, Nikki didn't. Murray Jacobs didn't. He was a very famous um, Canadian veteran who ran the Jewish War Veterans, uh, Jewish Legion post, um, uh, the Royal Canadian Legion in Toronto. I asked him, did you change your religion or change your dog tags or get different? You could change your, your, your dog tags in 1942. The government would allow you to put OD on it, other denominations. So if you got captured, you would be like, no one would know that you're Jewish. So I asked him, what did you do? He was a sergeant. Now, did you have a, a dog tag? And did you put your Hebrew on it? Oh, yeah. Because some people chose not to do that, as you I know. I don't believe in that. That's a bunch of crap. Okay? Because, first of all, if you're not proud of who you are, you shouldn't be there. That's what this was all about. There's guys in our outfit that had different denominations. They think that they're not going to find out that they were Jewish if they were found out. Come on, this is, you know, boo monsters. In fact, some people were so proud of being Jewish that they put the um, Magidovid on the nose cone of their fighter. This is the only one I can see that's Canadian who's done that. Most people put up pinup girls, like, I don't know, Betty Grable or whoever was popular in those days. He did this. He's his, his nephew, who's named after him because he didn't come back, is the cousin at Shari Tehila on uh, near Baycrest now, Gordon Steinberg. This is Gordon Lindsay is the cousin. Yeah, that's his uncle. He's named after him. Really? Yeah. Because of this, he was so proud. And he wasn't religious. But after he saw Palestine and what was happening, because he got to go there because he got malaria three times and they sent him there during the war, um, he did this. D-Day changed everything. Because until now, the Canadians and the um, Allies didn't really come face to face with the truth about what happened to Canada, to Europe's Jews. D-Day June 6th, they started to see the truth. As the Canadians, with their Jewish brothers side by side, arm in arm, you know, shoulder to shoulder, wearing the same uniform, stormed the beaches of Normandy, they started to see Jews coming out of hiding when they liberated France, and then Belgium, and then Holland, and then Germany. <coughs> and what they did is nothing short of a holy mitzvah, in my opinion. Rabbi Samuel Kass started having Hanukkah parties for the Jewish orphans when the Belgians were liberated in the fall of 44 by the Canadians, with Staff Sergeant Mimi Friedman Hart, I don't know who he is, I'd love to know, but she was one of the, she was the only Canadian Jewish woman decorated for bravery. She's from the Hearts, like Aaron Hart, like from Quebec, 1760, they came over with the Plains of Abraham, that's her family. She's one of the 12 great, great, ever so great grandchildren of the family. And she was there in Europe with the very few women who went as an interpreter. And the boys, the Jewish boys, the soldiers were asked to give up candy and their, their chocolates, whatever they could get from their home rations. People were sending them comfort boxes and salamis and stuff from home and they would give it to the orphans. So this was the fall of 44. And then they got to Holland in November of 44 and a town called Tilburg. And in Tilburg, just like the Maccabees, the Nazis had used the shul as their headquarters. So they desecrated it. And the Canadians liberated it, including a bunch of Canadians of Jewish faith. And many of the people in Tilburg had been deported, but a couple hundred were in hiding, and they came out, they cleaned off the synagogue, and a couple who'd been married before, civilly, decided that they wanted to have the first Jewish wedding at the shul. And Sergeant Paul Commissaro, the Royal Canadian Ordnance Corps, he's an Edmonton fellow, he and his friends had the minion, they held the chuppah for this wedding, and they all signed this little book, which some people in their families, you might have it, your fathers or your uncles or grandparents may have had this Jewish army prayer book. It was a little brown book. And they all signed it 
at the wedding, which we know about because the niece of this couple lives in Toronto and is a member of another shul, and she has the book. And they did this holy thing. And Jewish people uh, who were in the military did lots of other things as they were getting closer and closer to liberating the camps. For example, there's a book and some of the, the, the chaplain wrote in Hebrew. All the boys who were there signed it. Then they helped get some revenge. Hang on, I'm gonna go play this manually. The Jewish boys helped get revenge. An old Dutch synagogue in Nykirk, Holland, was partially demolished by the Dutch SS during the years of German occupation. Now the task of cleaning up the holy place is given to imprisoned Dutch Quislings who were responsible for its destruction. Under the supervision of Canadian troops, loyal Holland Jews dispense ironic justice as they drive the traitors to cleaning up their temple the hard way. Back in the 17th century, the community of Nykirk first admitted people of the Jewish faith to live and practice their beliefs as they wish. Relations between Jew and Christian have been friendly since the days of the Reformation. The iron heel of Nazi Germany could not stamp out the ancient religious customs which were observed underground. Now with victory comes freedom of thought and an honored place for free practice of all religious thought. The army loved this and they actually sent videographers to film this. I think it's great. I just love it. All this ironic took us hitting, right? For the Quislings. All right, but we're still only in November 44. The Canadians are in Holland. Um, they wanted to go to Berlin, but the Americans said, no, we're getting the credit. We're going to take Berlin. You go north and liberate the north of Holland. Sucks to be Canadian, right? Whatever. So we did, and Patton and all the good generals got the glory, but we could have been there too. So what happened was, they liberated Camp Vucht, which is a Nazi death camp in Holland. There are three camps in Holland. One is Westerbork, who was a transit camp, who was there, that was famous, and Frank. That's near Amsterdam, if you've all been, you might have seen it, gone to visit it. One is Amsfort, and Camp Vucht is near Nijmegen. This camp I went to, that's what I took, this is what it looked like during the war. I went because of this sitter and a Canadian Jewish soldier from Montreal. He was with the Regiment de la Chaudière. His name was Jacob or Jack Markovich. He was a plumber. He was 23. He was the only Anglo and the only Jew in this Quebec regiment. They liberated Camp Vucht. There were no Jews left. They had all been deported to Sobibor the year before, including 1,200 children. Um, it has a crematorium, which I don't know if you knew that, a Dutch camp had a crematorium. And when he got there, he saw his comrades one day, they were stationed for a while there, and his comrades were washing their jeep with a white, shiny towel that had blue stripes on it and fringes. And Jack said, what are you doing? Where did you get this? It was a talus. And the French guy said, there's millions of them in the room in the barracks. So, of course, Jack was horrified. And he went over, and of course, like you've all seen these, these storerooms, because the Jews who went there were told they're only going to work. So they brought everything with them. And he asked his commanding officer, can I take them all? And of course, no, because they were moving on. They were still fighting. They, they hadn't finished the fighting. So he took a Torah, uh, sorry, he took a sitter. This is the sitter and he took a talus, and he lovingly cared for them all the way through the war, and eventually he brought them home to Ottawa where he moved. And he would never wear it because he didn't feel worthy. But he did save this last sitter, and if you come to Liberation 75 with me and Bob, you will meet Jack's children, who are going to finally publicly speak about what his father did for the first time, but it's in my book. Because I found who it belongs to. The family's name is written right there, like the Christians do with all the kids and everything. And this is Jack's writing. And I found them. And I went to Holland with my son last year to tell them they're not Jewish because 
The whole family was killed except for one daughter who was put in a monastery and a son who jumped off the train and survived and moved to Israel. But the daughter who was in a monastery, she ended up converting, of course, the nuns converted her, and so the grandchildren did not know anything about the sitter or the talus or any of that stuff that a Canadian Jewish soldier lovingly saved from the Holocaust till I told them. And that's the son in my house with the book that he lovingly keeps. That's the granddaughter in Holland Don made a video for her to, sh to, so to say what his father did, and there's Don wearing the talus, which he only wears at his grandchildren's bar mitzvah. I know. It's amazing. He's never got, he never spoke about it he, until my book, This Is What I Do. Um, it's an amazing mitzvah that he did. As we're coming towards the end of March and the beginning of April, it's Pesach, 1945. I know, Costco has matzah, I know, it's making me scared. Okay, and Rabbi Kass asks the boys, there's our friend, Mr. Chanovsky. He said, I need a minion. We're going to make the first Jewish service in Germany in six years, maybe more. And he got more than a minion. He had all the Jewish boys who were there. They were about to cross the Rhine, and thousands would get killed. But this was the most meaningful thing that the Canadian Army even thought it was amazing and they took video. Here it is. Canadian troops of Jewish persuasion marched to a special service. It is the first Jewish church parade to be held on German soil since its capture. Men from all parts of the Dominion gather to worship. The service is conducted by Padre Samuel Cass of Montreal and Vancouver. Only one and one half percent of the Dominion's population is Jewish. There are upwards of 10,000 Jews in the Canadian Army alone. It's amazing. I still get goosebumps every time I see it. All right, so we're crossing the Rhine. The red are the Canadians. The Americans are going green to Berlin, and we get to liberate Northern Holland. And the Dutch go wild. Jubilation. And they have warm welcomes for the Canadians, those who were in Italy, that's, that's your relatives, I think, did the, the, the D-Day Dodgers, they, they fought through Italy, they joined the Canadians who were already coming from Normandy from France, and they liberated Holland. And the problem, or the, the mission of the Jewish boys who were in uniform became also fighting, but rescue. They went to Westerbork, they had services in Westerbork, and Frank had been transferred to Belsen, and Jack Markovich is at Belsen on April 14th. April 15th, I'm sorry, April 16th. There he is, arresting Joseph Kramer, the beast of Belsen. The British liberated Belsen, quote, liberated. The, the Germans basically made a deal to give it up, quietly, without any fighting. Jack was so angry at what they saw that he wanted to shoot the commandant. Notice he's in non, there's no like braids or embroidery or medals because he was in a private's uniform because he was trying to escape. But the British officer said, don't shoot him, take him for the war crimes trial, which they did, and he was executed in December of 45. So a Jewish plumber from Montreal who already saved this beautiful mitzvah that he did in Kamfukt is now taking his place in history at Bergen Belsen. And why do we know he's there? Because there was a video of him, and I'm going to show it to you. And then I'm going to call up Bob, whose father's pictures are even more incredible. This is a German video. I'm showing it to you. It's in German. There are no bodies. It is from the Steven Spielberg Shoah Foundation. It's, I'm just telling you, it's Belsen. If it's triggering for you, don't look. It's only a minute long. Der Weg der Befreiung, ein Vormarsch in die Pölle. Am 15. April 1945 erreicht das britische 63. Panzerabwehrregiment Bergen-Belsen am Südrand der Lüneburger Heide. Der Lagerkommandant Josef Kramer und seine Bewachungsmannschaften werden überrascht und gefangen genommen. Die Briten wissen auch um die Vernichtungslager im Ort. Amazing. That's him. Jack, Jack was there. He never spoke about it. It was too traumatizing for him. 
But 40 years later, the CBC interviewed him because that video was on TV. Remember those 80s couches and that 80s TV that we all had? Yeah? Okay, well, this is what... And I'm going to show you what he said. That's Don, his son. At first, Jack Markovich didn't believe Don had seen him, but he agreed to watch the film with his son, and he recognized himself. And for the first time, he began to tell his son what he saw in April 1944. He just said, 45. I smell it again. The stench. The stench was something. It was something that you cannot understand. You're dead. You're not there. You're in a house with clean, fresh air. You know what was going on there? It was something that, it's unbelievable. This was systematic killing of ordinary people. Yeah, that's, that's you and the commonwealth. This is something, um, I don't know if you know, but these are photos from another Canadian um, RCAF airman from Montreal, Mo Rezin, talking to Lodge survivors. These are women from Lodge that survived he is helping them. They're trying to do what's called the great hunt, which is find their relatives. And there's no mail in those days, so Mo wrote letters with the Canadian Air Force mail and helped them find their relatives. He also took these pictures of the lodge women, and on the back, this is what he wrote. Distributing some chocolates, candies, cigarettes, etc. Forbidden to give them substantial food because they would die from the stomach, they are not used to it. This is a Canadian Jewish airman from Montreal as well. These photos are now in the Holocaust Museum in Los Angeles. And now, I'd like to have the honor of calling up Bob Delson to talk to us about his father and his experiences in the war. Bob? Thank you, Alan. Pardon me. <clears throat> so, we were going to just... Uh, start off. We have seven questions that I kind of prepared with Bob, but he does have some things uh, I can show you while he talks about them, and there's some slides. I'll use this mic up here, okay, so you can hear me? Sure. Oopsie. All right? Yes. Can you all hear me? No, I turned it off. I broke the internet. No, it doesn't work. Okay, how about now? It's working, yeah. All right, so this is your dad, Correct. Bob Delson, very dapper and uh, very nice picture. Uh, what is his actual real name? His name is Bernard Delson. He was started off as Bernard Udell. Uh, he was born in uh, Bridgewater, Nova Scotia. Uh, his father, uh, actually he was born because his actual brother passed away while they were in Nova Scotia. And my father was born there. They traveled to Saskatchewan from there, and they lived in Saskatchewan for many years, and then go, went to Montreal. You mentioned Udell, and we have Arnold. What was, but what was your uh, Udlitz, was wasn't original? it? Udlitz, and I think right. so was yours. Right. My grandfather came from Russia. He was worried about being found by the Tsar when he got to Halifax. So he took his name Udell and he made it Udelson. From there, they moved to Montreal, and my father didn't really like the fact that he had this long name, so he changed it to Delson. So, as a Jewish tradition, we've been circumcised three times. <laughs> <laughs> now, tell us a little bit about his life just before he enlisted. What were his jobs? What was he doing? Dad, Dad was a tradesman. Uh, he worked uh, as an electrician. He worked at many jobs. Uh, his two sisters were involved in the garment industry in Montreal. My, his sister, Anne, Anne was, uh, began the... Um, uh, union in Montreal, the Garment Workers Union, and uh, Dad kept doing various things uh, till he moved on to, to Europe and uh, volunteered, went over to uh, England and traveled across Europe with the RCA. Okay, so he's in uniform here. Tell us what his job was. Dad's job was a rigger. A rigger was a person who actually outfitted the airplanes with bombs, uh, did various things to get them going. Uh, they did some reconnaissance while he was over there. They flew mosquitoes. Uh, what was the other? I forgot the other uh, aircraft he flew was uh, typhoons. Typhoons, correct. He also flew. He also uh, tippies, correct? They called tippies. Tippies, yeah. yes. Uh, he also did a lot of uh, reconnaissance with the with several different aircraft, and he was actually uh, quite involved with that. He enjoyed it a lot, and. Because he was doing reconnaissance, he also had a, the option of having a camera with him 
So he traveled through Europe taking pictures of everywhere they went, all the way from England right into bergen belsen he was probably illegally taking pictures too, because you weren't some because you know loose lakes live, sink ships and stuff. Thank God. Now, how did you discover these unbelievable photos? Where are they? What did you bring with you? That, Dad had this hidden in the basement. He very seldom wanted to talk about it. Uh, I guess his experience in Belson wasn't really wonderful, and because of that, he had it in the basement along with some souvenirs that he had. Um, I brought them out. I, I kind of forced him to talk about it more often than not, and he gave some information as to what he had, where he was, and it was difficult. It was very difficult to get him to talk about it, but he did. You can't imagine why, because look at the photos. This is a, a, a there are bodies in this photo. This is a picture your dad took, basically a day or two after Belson was liberated. Correct. This is where dad was. This is the, uh, the, mass, the, grave. Left, the mass graves that he took when and he was in Belson. Seven. Correct. And as he went through that, he actually visited this personally, and this is probably one of the reasons why he didn't want to talk about it. Um, he had many other pictures going all the way through Europe he took. He was in Eindhoven. Oh, this is yeah, a continuation of the uh, vast graves that they had there. The Germans had, once the, uh, the English and the Canadians came in, the Germans ran, and of course they left everything the way it was. Unfortunately, uh, uh, all the mass graves, many that were open, some have been covered, but not too many, unfortunately. What do we know about this photo? That's the hanging tree, isn't it? That's the hanging tree, that's right. Oh my gosh, I yeah. forgot about that, yeah. Uh, what about this? Tell this, us about this unbelievable story. This is, I've got a picture of it down in here, mm -hmm. uh, and I've got the actual one at home. It's a, it's a Juden star. I can't, it's too heavy. No, it's too heavy. It's a Juden star, and when Dad went into the camps, uh, this prisoner, or person that was there, actually took it off his uniform, signed it, and gave it to my father. We've, uh, we're now looking for the individual who, who gave it to him, and he is obviously somewhere, or his, his uh, name and where he lived is somewhere. But um, he was very thankful that my father liberated him, and... Um, this is all I got. My father wouldn't talk about it. Uh, yes, sir. What is the man's name? Let's tell him because we're trying to find it. We're trying to find it also. So his name is Leo Rothstein That's from right. a Correct. street in Belgium and Correct. Brussels. We know Correct. the name of the street. We can't read the address too well. It's no, seven it's, or seventy-five. Yeah. Jean Dubuc in Brussels. That's and right. there were people from that street with that name who were one was killed. Um, I haven't told you that I found it, oh, you got some but I didn't find him. I found a relative who was also killed in the Holocaust. So we've right. written last week. This is fresh. We don't know yet what's yeah. going to happen. We just sent this off to the Belgian Holocaust Deportation Museum. Correct. They said we'll get back to you in three weeks. Meanwhile, we're we're plutzing over here. We want to know. Get the so as soon as we know, I'm going to write about it, and we'll write about it Absolutely. together. Absolutely. And find Absolutely. if we can find this man or his family, we will contact we'd like, them. We'd like to find him. We'd like to bring it forth and. Uh, Pick some history up out of it. Amazing. Wonderful. No one's ever seen this before. You just found it in a box. I found it in a box along with Dad's medals and his service records and so on and so forth. So, yeah, it's quite interesting. I'm quite excited about that. Now, That's, there's you, the cutie. Yeah. That's me, all right. I want to ask you about the f your understanding as a young man growing up after the war with your dad. Nowadays, we would call it PTSD. What do you make of the impact that his war service had on him from the, seeing all these pictures and now going through this journey? Dad came home. Maybe you can uh, say well, of course, he, I was not born when he left. And uh, when, I came, when he came back, I was about four years old. Um, Dad was kind of reserved at a, for a while. Um, he was difficult to ask questions about. He wasn't the same person that left, as my mother was telling me. And uh, they didn't stay together too long after that. They divorced probably a year after uh, he returned home. And uh, I stayed with my mother. And uh, we grew up with her. And then, of course, uh, I went back to my father when I got a little bit older. Kind of went back and forth. But um, it, it was very interesting. As a child, I didn't remember too much of it. I have some memories of growing up with my mother, but with my father, very little. What do you hope people Oops. take away from these photos that your dad took at Belson? What's dad, the message in these photos? My dad was very proud of what he did 
going across Europe uh, into Bergen-Belsen. Although he didn't talk much about Belsen, he really felt proud of his service going over there and what he did and the soldiers that were with him. Uh, he came back with the same pride. Unfortunately, the Belsen part of it really hurt him a lot. But he, he was wanting people to understand what they did over there, what happened over there. What was the real meaning of what they went for? Because it was important that people knew that this doesn't go away, that the, they lost a lot of people there. And because they lost so many people, because people dedicated themselves to this, it was very important that it keeps going forward. And he wanted that very much. And we thank you so much for having the courage and, and, and the honor of giving this to us tonight. It's a gift, and we are so thankful that you're sharing your father's legacy with us. Thank you very much. So before I finish off, um, and we'll open the floor to questions, I just have a couple, and there are, you can come up afterwards. I know Bob will be happy to show you his, uh, what he brought, right, with him. Um, there's a couple of other things we have to do before we continue, before we open it up. And that is, it wasn't all um, um, those horrible, shocking photos. There were also some nicer photos, which I want to just quickly show you before we go on, because um, one of you is related to one of them. Forget who it was. When the boys from Canada went overseas, the Jewish boys, Canadian Jewish Congress had a whole thing of sending care packages with kosher salami and socks, and I don't know if any of your families did that. These are care packages. And a Jewish boy from Calgary named Stanley Winfield teamed up with his squadron leader, who was not Jewish, because they said that the armies were not doing enough for the Belsen survivors. There were 60,000 people who survived, 14,000 died in the next few weeks of typhus and other dysentery and other diseases. They weren't strong enough. But they were just sort of left there. There wasn't enough stuff for them. The, the army was moving on, right? It was this, they were almost at the end of the war, but not yet. There was still fighting to be done. So he said, he asked all his boys to donate their care packages because he said, we got to help the orphans. They're only giving them three meager meals a day. So he asked his fellows to get 150 chocolate bars, sandwiches, milk, and three trucks, bring them to the country, and have Sunday picnics. And so there, this is what the Jewish boys did. And not only Jewish, Canadian airmen did. There's Bernard Yale. Whose relative is that? Somebody, that's your relative. That's your uncle. And yours too. Cousin. Cousin. There he is. He's also a photographer. He was in intelligence. And he was taking the orphans with our friend Stanley Winfield every week in Belson. Maybe you have never seen these pictures before. But again, he never got a medal for it. He should have. They all should have. I want to tell you that um, for 75 years, Canadian government never recognized the contribution that Canada's Jewish community did to help win the war. It never properly acknowledged the sacrifices of men like Albert Garshowitz, your uncle, Hashi's uncle, who was a dam buster, who uh, was the Jewish dam buster, and your uncle, of course, and all of your families who served and the 450 who didn't come home. And I've been lobbying for years to get this changed. On their website, Veterans Affairs had, this is an old website, they had Chinese Canadians, Black Canadians, Indigenous veterans, hockey players, but nothing about the 17, well, 19,000 Jews uh, who served and faced a double threat, a triple threat. And Harry will know. Harry's here. I'd like to acknowledge Harry Coles from the Jewish War Veterans of Canada Toronto Post in the back. Harry. Um, they, they just, they didn't know. I don't think it was anti-Semitism. They just had no clue until I started writing about it. And I'm very happy to tell you that this fall, there is a wonderful web exhibit based on my book on the website of Veterans Affairs Canada with the whole story. And I didn't do it for me, of course, I did it for the men in your families and the women who served because most of them are gone, just like most of the Holocaust survivors are going to be, in the next few years, sadly, not around with us, or we've lost many of their voices. So for history, for young people, for the haters, for the deniers who say it never happened and the Jews didn't fight and there was no Holocaust, 
This website is a legacy that I'm so proud to have helped change what I thought was a historic wrong, and this came out in the fall. Um, because we have a duty, not just as Jews who have Holocaust uh, relatives, but also as Jews whose family were the liberators, like Bob and your family and all of you. Remembering isn't just for one day a year or two, Yom HaShoah or November 11th. Every day we should be remembering. And what we do, I'm sure your synagogue does, is an active verb. We have a lot of work to do, my people. There are, um, there is so much anti-Semitism, so much bigotry, so much anti-everything. We have hate in the States, we have terror in Europe, we have people saying that the coronavirus is a conspiracy, I'm waiting to hear that it's a Jewish COVID-19, right? That's your joke. COVID, get it? No, 19. Um, it's a Jewish threat. Um, so we have a lot of work to be vigilant and to take the torch of people like Izzy Bell, who was killed, he was a Montreal machinist, he was with the Hastings and Prince Edward Regiment, killed in Italy, and on his tombstone says, Oh Israel, here lies your servant, defender of truth, justice, and brotherhood. So they will not have died in vain. Thank you. So uh, there are people that would like to say a few words, and uh, there are some people we'd like to recognize, and I'll hand it over to you and open up the floor. I'm going to be very quick, um, but just two quick things. First of all, if you didn't meet me, I'm Alan Herman. I'm one of the uh, co-founder or er, co-chairs for the Canadian Institute for Jewish Research, one of your partner organizations for tonight, along with Canadian Anti-Semitism Education Foundation. Doris Epstein is another co-chair. We have we do great events. Our stuff is out front. Don't miss it as you head out. And that being said, uh, before we open it up full out to questions, I see your eyes burning into me, Steve. Before, before we open it up to questions, Harry Colt, Harry Colt, are you here? Are you here? Harry Colt, um, Ellen, we're going to catch you off guard with a little something. Um, uh, Harry, could you... Uh... I could go to him. Okay. I'll go to you. Harry, I'll go to you. Maybe bring the mic. So long. Okay, I'll come to you. No, no, I'll come to you. Ladies and gentlemen, you have the honor this evening to speak or to hear one of the most uh, beneficial per individuals in our Jewish community. Words could not express the work and the effort that Ellen put into this effort, and she's still continuing to do it. It is something that is going to go down in history. And our, hopefully, our grandchildren and our great-grandchildren and our great-grandchildren will read this book that she wrote, Double Threat, and have an appreciation of what our forefathers did so that we could have freedom that we have today. And Ellen has documented a lot of this, and I think that we owe her a special round of applause for her work and the rest of the Canada, I'd like to present you this Flames of Memory Memorial Medal to be worn on your right side of your chest in recognition of your extensive and outstanding work in researching and documenting the contribution of Canadian Jews in World War II. This medal serves to remind mankind of the Jewish involvement in the ongoing battle against hatred, bigotry, and injustice. Together with people of goodwill, of all faiths, we will achieve our hopes and ambition of peace worldwide. Amen. 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 Unexpected. Very unexpected. She really didn't know that was coming. I'm just thankful for accepting this. I, I honored because I didn't fight. I had nine people in my family who served. One didn't come home. 
Um, and so it's for all of your families and all those that didn't come back who uh, I accept this with gratitude. Thank you so much. You're very welcome. <laughs> Take some pictures and then we'll get to the next. Yes, sure. So, um, in advance of the full question and answer period, I'm going to ask uh, Dr. San Steve Samuels to come up and share his story, which I think you will find spellbinding. Thank you. Uh, I just want to say how moved I was by what I heard tonight. Sadly, I see very few young people here. Anyway, uh, and if you're wondering why I'm wearing a beard, because tonight, four weeks ago, my mother passed away, our mother. So I'm still a veil. In any case, the similarities and the contrast between the story that you told and what I'm going to try to briefly tell you is, is, uh, is spellbinding. Um, our father was born in Transylvania in a city called Cluj. And in around Shavuot of 1938, he heard, he was about 17 years old, the story was circulating that there's a ship that's being organized for Jews to go to Palestine. Anyway, his father was a Zionist, although he was quite religious, and he may, managed to pay for one family member, which was his one and only son. My father ended up arriving in Palestine after a tumultuous voyage uh, with 800 other Jews. Ship burned down in the Aegean. They ended up being picked up by an Italian frigate to Italy because Italy, and they were taken to Rhodes because Rhodes before the war used to belong to Italy. And subsequently he was dropped off the shore of Natania, uh, about a kilometer off, swam in with one pound sterling tucked into his, in his underwear, underwear while the British were strafing the water. In any case, the, uh, in 1941, so my father, our father arrived there in, uh, uh, must have been around August of 1939. In 1941, I'm skipping ahead, one of his sisters arrived in Palestine on the last legal ship that the British allowed in. When the war broke out in 1939, first of September, soon thereafter, my father enlisted in the British Army. This was before the Jewish Brigade was formed, and he was based in Alexandria in Egypt in the Eighth Army. And meanwhile, in 1944, again around Shavuot, the Hungarian and the Transylvanian Jewish communities were deported to Auschwitz. Among those people who were deported were his two, were his two parents, his older sister, Sarah, who was 23, and her three-year-old son, Ephraim, after whom I am named. Um, I have letters going up till 1944. I have letters, some of them as 1944 approaches, that, through the Red Cross, with cutouts, censors, censored, censored letters. In any case, my father is in the 8th Army. They fight against uh, the Germans in North Africa and then invade Sicily. At the end of the war, my father is based in Venice. And the war is over in Europe around the 4th of May. A day or two later, he meets someone from his city in Transylvania who had been liberated a few days earlier uh, by the Americans from a concentration camp in, in Austria. And this man said to my father, listen, in January, five months ago, I saw your father alive in Dachau. My father went to his commanding officer and asked for leave. And he hitchhiked to Munich in British uniform. To, you know, he arrived there in a day and a half uh, from Venice. And he walked into Dachau. And he walked into the building that housed the records. And he looked up his father's name, Yechir Shamuel, and it said, 
in this block, in this barrack. He walked there and immediately he saw the door was open and my grandfather was sitting at a sink washing a cup. So he went up to him and my grandfather looked up at him and he said, yes, what do you want? He says, I'm your son, David. He says, no, my son is in Palestine and he's not a soldier. My father took out a family photo to prove to his father that he's his son. Of course, my grandfather passed out. Everybody started to cry and so on. My father, after my grandfather sort of came back, the first thing he wanted to do was to daven. Mm -hmm. And you mentioned earlier, there was a hill of talit, talitim and tefillin. The tefillin I use today is from Dachau. I don't know to whom it belonged. The talit was lost on an El Al flight in a suitcase, but my mother had the tefillin in her carry-on. So, my father, I mean, the story goes on, he almost accidentally died in the gas chamber in Dachau because as he was walking in Munich, he hears someone yell to him, Dave, and it was one of his friends in a jeep. And this friend had another fellow in the jeep with him. He says, what are you doing here? He says, I found my father alive. He says, where? In Dachau. He says, show us Dachau. So my father hops into the jeep, they go to Dachau, and as he's showing them the gas chamber, his friend says, listen, I want, you to, I want to take a picture of you. My father stood just inside the door, and this other fellow, who my father didn't know, pushed a button on the wall, and the fan started going, there were still cyclone particles. My father was resuscitated in a German hospital, can you imagine? No. He was wow. okay. Now, this is a movie. This is a movie. Now, Sir Martin Gilbert ran across my grandfather's memoirs, and in his book on the history of the Holocaust, many of you may have it, it's The Holocaust, The History of the Jews of Europe during the Second World War, page 815, you can read my grandfather's story. So, I, when this happened, after this happened, my father arranged for his father to go back, to go to Italy, to Bari, because that's where they were shipping the Jews to Palestine. Yeah. My father and a few other friends of his, and Jewish, uh, uh, Jewish friends, stole a few British army trucks. And they started to ferry uh, refugees from German camps to Bari, where they were put on Haganah ships. And one day my father was driving a truck, and it was an open bed truck, and one of the women refugees from from Landsberg, which was a women's camp adjacent to Dachau. One of these women had a patch on her eye because she must have had some infection, so she couldn't sit in the open truck. And, my and, and she ended up sitting in the cab. When these women arrived in Palestine, the British captured them, put them into a clique prison mm -hmm. to be shipped to Cyprus the next day to a concentration camp. And Yitzhak Rabin led a unit of Palmach. They drugged the guards and they dispersed them through a key. Kibbutzim and Moshevim. A few months later, this, my father's walking on the beach in Tel Aviv and he met this woman. That's our mother. Was our mother until a month ago. She still is our mother. Um, it's funny, my brother looked up. We, we are distant relatives through marriage and otherwise of Yudel. He just looked it up on Jeannie. Really? Uh, and well, we did. Well, yeah. Oh my and God. In, I'll take pictures of you guys. Okay, no, but. but uh, That's crazy. You know, the, right? the stories of these people are just, if you wrote as a fiction, nobody would, would believe it, you know. Uh, the point is that here is someone whose story, similar, but an unusual story, unusual enough that a British historian who was Winston Churchill's biographer, had found it so unusual for someone to find someone alive. Yeah, so, in any case, I want to thank you for giving me a chance to tell my story, or our family story. You need to come and do a whole thing. Thank you, Dr. I think that...
we could do a whole evening in the future, and you should, and I can help you all the places that I've spoken, I will help you. You've got to develop something and do it, because it's fascinating. And I'm honored that you were here tonight with all these wonderful people to share it. I wish we and I'm so sorry on the loss of your mother. Thank you very much. So, do we have five minutes for questions? People want to have coffee and, and rogalach? Go for it, sure. So, or anybody want to say anything or add your story? You have a question. Just a quick question. I, mean, I spoke to you earlier, and uh, it's a very emotional. I mean, the evening is very emotional. I mean, my, my, my family went through there. My father arrived in '41 to Israel, also somehow through Turkey, and all these stories. Seventy-five years later, you are really truly the gem that brought this out to light, uh, and I hope it continues because the Holocaust Education Week, and I've been to a few of the events. It's always. I hate to say it, we shall never forget, but it's always the same old, same old, and it's always preaching to the choir. Mm. Uh, what you have brought us today was, I wouldn't necessarily call it good news, but it was news that very few people knew, and I'm a history buff. I didn't know it. I knew about the Jews in the, arm, in the armed forces. I knew about the Jews in the SS who were fighting in Germany. I knew about the Jews in the American forces, the British forces, the Italian, etc. but I never knew about the Canadian. I've only been in Canada 42 years. What possessed you, after 75 years, to come up with this? Thank you for the question. Well, like my nine relatives, they never talked about it, except the jokes. And when my nephew said, Grandpa, what did you do in the war for grade seven project or something, they would interview. But they only told the good stuff, like sleeping through the blitz and playing soccer and getting... I, you know, I went to Normandy in 2011. Um, because my friend Ted Barris, who wrote an incredible book about uh, uh, the Downbusters, and you should all read it, um, said, you got to go to Normandy. So I took my kids and my husband, and one didn't want to get out of the car because he was 10, and he was playing with his Game Boy, or whatever it was called. Remember those Game Boys? And the older one, who was 14, came with us, and we wandered through the... Who's been to Normandy, to the Juno Beach cemeteries? Anyone? You have. Anybody been to any of these other cemeteries? Like Holland, what you've been to Reichswald, and... They're beautiful, they're haunting, they're maintained beautifully, grass, tombstones. And so we went, like Jews do, and we looked for the Jewish stars on the boys' tombstones, because well, that's what you do. And we found, a, I found about 11 at the time. There are, I now know there are more, and they're all on my website. Um, and we found one whose epitaph, just like Izzy Bell, reached out to me after 70 years in the grave and said, you got to find out who I am, because what it said was, he died so Jewry shall suffer no more. And I still get goosebumps when I read it. And it was a boy from Toronto, Meltz, George Meltz. So when I came home, I googled, of course, what do you do? And I found not only did his namesake, George Meltz Jr., uh, well, they don't do that Jewish news, but he was named after him, lived three blocks from me in Richmond Hill, but he was also the president of my shul, a few, you know, and I was like, that's creepy, but amazing. And then my cousin's best friend is Isabel Meltz, because there were 10 kids, three sets of twins ladies, can you imagine? Um, which is why she died at 56, which actually was a long time in those days. And um, yeah, and so I, I started writing about him, uh, because no one had ever written about this stuff before. And then people started telling me, what about my uncle, what about my father, what about my cousin, what about... And I found out I had nine people in my family, and no one had ever talked about it. And they were all dead, except for one, thank God, because Uncle Leo told me, and that's who the book is dedicated to, what his life and experience was like. So that's what got started, and then the publisher of None is Too Many said I should write a book about it. And he was Malcolm Lester, and he published my book too. And then U of T Press bought it, and the rest is history. No pun intended. And I do speak to non-Jewish audiences many, many, many. I do that many times, all the time. I don't do the Jewish jokes as much because they don't get it. <laughs> but I explain what chutzpah is and some other things. And I try to, to, to reach up. I'll get to you in a second. I was in Picton last week. Picton. Anyone go there for the summer? Yeah, Picton. Okay, but there's like no Jews. Well, there's a few. They're all Toronto Jews. And there's one girl. There's a few Jews. There. There's a few. And there's, there's anti-Semitism in Picton. Everywhere. A schoolgirl from Kingston goes there, it's the public school, and they throw pennies at her, write swastikas on her uh, locker. This is now, people! 
this is now in September of this year in Picton. And she said, that's enough. And she spoke, her father was a city councilor. So she spoke up about it. And she got hate mail, but she also launched a conversation. And I spoke about this when I was there. Because people said, and the audience said to me, a farmer who's not Jewish said, well, why do people hate Jews so much? I don't understand it. And I was like, how long do you have? You know, like, <laughs> but I tried to explain why. And I did gave the Deborah Lipstadt three definitions of anti-Semitism and, and tell them they have to stand up and stop being bystanders. And as our wonderful friend Max Eisen and always says, be an upstander, not a bystander. And you have to stop it and say something and do something. And that's what I try to do. And I have 30 more speeches in the next few weeks. And then May, June, July, it's busy. You know, November is like tax time for accountants for me. Right? So, so uh, I, I, I'm still doing this uh, and it's my mission. Question. Here's the mic. Because people can hear you. Um, my father landed in, um, he landed in Normandy about a week after D-Day. Okay, I've been asked to stand up and turn around. Um, my father landed in D-Day, um, he landed about a week after D-Day, and uh, he went through France, he wound up in Germany, and I remember asking him at one point, many, many years ago, you know, did you know what was going on? And he had no clue. Like the average person who was in a unit, they, they were just, they were, you know, fighting the enemy and just trying to stay alive. And he had all sorts of stories. Um, you know, one time they were being strafed by, by German bombers and they, thankfully, there was a, a, a train car on a siding and they all dove under it because there was no place else and thankfully that saved them. But they actually had no idea. I mean, these Do you people know what were no, I, I mean, we have documents, I would have to go back get and Get in look. touch with me, I'll help you uh, get, get that for Okay, because, I mean, these people liberated, so they, obviously, they knew, but he, he, and he wasn't the only Jewish person, you know, that he knew of in that circumstance, and they absolutely had no idea until after the war what was going on, which was remarkable. Do you know what? Did he get his Legion d'honneur? He deserves it. The French government gives Legion d'honneur medals for every liberator. He's not alive anymore, is he? Right, Harry? They, sure, sure. they did for all the liber I mean, all the Jewish and non-Jewish veterans who liberated France were able to get a Legion d'honneur uh, if they're alive. The government will award you one, which is the highest medal that you can get. So, take my card. I have a website, and it'll help you. And I can you can get your father. Is your father? He's not alive, right? So, how long ago did he pass? Okay, so you can get his records like this. Well, in 10 months, it takes about 10 months because anybody that's passed longer than 20 years, they don't give you a hard time. Um, and you can get his records, and it's in, who's got their father's war records? Anybody? They're incredible what you will find. So I'll help, I'll help you. It's a one page form, you literally mail it to them, and 10 months later, you'll get them. It's amazing. I have my father's soldier book. Amazing. That's probably the same color, like orangey brownish. It's a small book. Like small. This. And the w your last will. Yeah. It, the will is right in the back. Yeah. And it, and it, he's got drawings how to dismantle a mine. He was an engineer. He, he, he was in the Royal Engineers. He was a sapper. Yeah. There's a question, Doris. This won't come. I remember years ago and being astonished to find out that Abba Bayeski was. Uh, a war journalist, and he's not mentioned in your book. No, and that is a uh, and an error. I should have done that. About his work. You should have done that. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't know when I was writing it. I couldn't get everyone in, and I apologize for all of the seventeen thousand. Uh, I did as best as I could, but. You're right, and I apologize to you. And I'd love you to hear, if you wouldn't mind, saying a few words, Evelyn. Uh, well, we were married in 1947, so uh, I was really not familiar with what had happened uh, during the war. And in fact, when I look back, I was in high school, and we were oblivious, really. That's what you mentioned, they didn't know. We didn't know. I, I, was, I grew up in Oshawa, the Oshawa Collegiate. But uh, in it, 
my husband was a, uh, a war artist, and uh, he was in Belson two or three days after it was liberated. So there are many drawings and paintings which he did, which document what he saw. All of these are in the Canadian War Museum in Ottawa, and they are uh, available there to be seen. The Canadian War Museum is a, um, a marvelous place, just marvelous. Uh, so much is, is, uh, is documented there. I just want to say one thing. Well, uh, I'm the daughter, Edra, and um, thank you for saying that. And also, um, my father never put the Holocaust behind him, and he spent his entire life painting um, in order for people to remember. He never, he never let it go. And uh, some of his subsequent pieces are also at the War Museum. But he never let it go, and he did a whole series called the Epilogue Series, um, skeletal images. And half of those were donated to Yad Vashem and are in Yad Vashem. And um, the other half nobody is interested in. So they're still in our collection, which is a real shame. Because nobody, nobody wants to see them. And the because they're too graphic or because they would have to pay for them? Like, what is the problem as far as you're, in your opinion? Nobody, uh, well, actually, if you go onto the website of the War Museum, and there, there's a, they write briefly about one of the pieces called, um, I think it's called Remembering the Holocaust. And there's a sort of a small paragraph that says it, that no galleries are interested in his work, but the War Museum uh, is and was interested in, in his work. Uh, because the galleries, it's the public galleries, refuse to show it. Mm -hmm. We're not talking about selling them. Mm -hmm. In fact, he knew, you know, my father knew that nobody's going to want to buy these things, put them in their house. But Maybe this shul would be considering having a, a vernissage uh, part of Yom HaShoah. I can ask my shul, sorry. Well, I can ask my shul to do it. Yeah, they're never, yeah. Because no, no, we should no, talk no, afterwards no, and we should get in touch because that, that, should, be, that should be done. Thank you. Abba Bayevsky. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor to have you with us. Yeah, quick question in the back. Are you able to ascertain any information, say, if I told you my father was in the Russian army during the war? So, I am not an expert in Russian Jewish uh, servicemen. However, there is, Harry, you might know who they are. There is a uh, Russian Jewish military unit that they, May 7th, they always get together with Mac, Martin Maxwell, and they have a, a, a liberation dinner at a Russian restaurant in Toronto. Um, Alex Eisen was quite a me very famous member, and I'm sure that we could hook you up. They might be able to help you, so talk to me afterwards, and I'll give you what Ma Martin Maxwell will know, right? Since he deals with that all the time. Right, right. And also, uh, there is a book that was written by Derek Penslar, Professor Derek Penslar. Uh, he's an expert on this. A call, it came out in 2014 about all the... 1.5 million Jews who fought in World War II, including Russian and elsewhere, and the 500,000 Americans. Um, so you can email him. Again, uh, he just has a new book out about Herzl. So he's doing the book tour thing. But I'm sorry I'm not, but I can help you. Okay? One last question or a comment anybody wanted to share? Yes. Well, first of all, a lot of it is so familiar, the idea that the servicemen never spoke about their experience. I don't know if this will come that far. I don't think so. The only thing, sorry, no, so my father was in the Air Force. He was from Regina. He joined the Navy, and he said they weren't going overseas fast enough. What Navy in the, for a kid from the, from the prairies, I don't know. But he eventually joined the Air Force and went overseas. Um, but what I wanted to mention, and maybe you're aware of What was his name? David Spindle. From Regina. Yeah. Was so, he, hold on. Donna? Is a, is a daughter? No. No. Deborah and Andrea. Deborah. I'm Andrea. Right. I know about them because they're in a book. I wrote the book. I'm Andrea. 
Right. So right. I was just going to say to you. Right. No, Who's on first? Wait a second. Hold on a second. Um, you said he joined the Navy. He ended up, he started in the Navy, and they weren't going anywhere. Several months he later, he transferred to the Air Force. So you know that. But the reason I stood up is that um, there is a, a former journalist and an author in Calgary that, are, that has published a book on the uh, servicemen from southern Alberta. Yes, of course. I didn't know if you knew about it. But yeah, I made sure my father, who I, was not from Alberta, Tyler, got in the book. Or Tyler something or other. Tyler Trafford. Yeah. And then he and I worked on a book about our family from Poland that's and their life right. in Calgary. Wow, it's so exciting oh. to meet you. Oh, that's good. Okay. I well, might well. have actually put you in my bibliography. <laughs> As a matter of fact, I have to look at later. Tyler did a number of books on the, for the family. We've all, Various people have worked with him and commissioned him. So I have all of the books, including the one called... Uh, um, Auntie Singer, Mima Singer, the aunt, the Mima, the Mima. She's the one who brought everybody over from, from Europe. I'm going to go out on a limb because I don't remember. Dry cleaning? No. What was your father's family? Bakery? No. What was your father's My business? Zeta had a little shoe store in Regina. A shoe store. Okay. And my, on the my I have that book. And the other one had a little furniture store in Calgary and ended up on one street that were five furniture stores, all relatives. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much. Um, I did want to mention that uh, the family, the people that have spoken to me at the table and telling me that they were in Belson or married in Belson or their parents got married in Belson. So I want to just shout out to um, um, Cheryl Cooper, whose parents ran Lola's Shoes, and our survivors um, were married in Belson with the same wedding dress that went around. So thank you for sharing that with me. So I guess we will end it here. I am um, happy to continue the discussion. Arnold and Alan and Rafi and all of you and Harry, thank you. And Bob, thank you for a wonderful evening and I'll see you outside. You were asking about the Jews, in, uh, the Jews in Russia and the Armed Forces. Who was that? The fellow in the back. Okay, so there is a very, very well-known book. I'll get you the title. Uh, there are between three and 500,000 Jews conscripted into the Armed Forces in, in, uh, by the Red Army. So it's a, it's a heck of a number. <laughs> Very moving, eh? Very. Probably your father did something in the war here. He went uh, 1945. He went over. So, uh, Literally late. He was after D Day. He wasn't really. So when can I. Uh, he was uh, Shalom. They were marching. That's how I always end it. Oh. <laughs>